Hey guys, welcome to the Canada Puck Podcast, your weekly recap of what's going on in the world of sports, specifically hockey, and even more specifically in Canada. I'm your co-host, Mick. You can find me on Twitter at Profit Mick, and I'm joined ever by my lovely and talented co-host, Grant, on Twitter at Fourth Line Sports. Uh, there's no dropper per vagina point this time, which is oddly appropriately ob- oddly appropriate because we have left our listeners with the proverbial blue balls over the last few weeks. Well, I don't even know where to begin. All this My goofy fault. shit has happened in the NHL. My fault. <laughs> I don't like working to begin with. Like forty hours a week ain't for me. Like 30, 30, 32, maybe. Maybe I'm pushing it there. Uh, I had to work a couple weekends the last week, so it's awkward. But yeah, we have been a lot has changed in the last two weeks, as is what happens in the playoffs. So we have a little bit to recap here, uh, as well as some teams to bury. We had two teams remaining last time we talked. There are no Canadian teams left in the playoffs anymore. No, and we'll get all that to all that. But you brought up an interesting point because I had this conversation yesterday. You know what the worst type of work is? Like, absolute worst. Shift work. Imagine, like, being so committed to a job that you're willing to forego sleep for the betterment of a company or an organization. Mm-hmm. Not for me, man. Definitely not for me. No, I, I, and actually, speaking of playoffs last year, and I'm starting to think maybe my job just doesn't like me being happy. I'm pretty sure I worked, like, nights. It was like 10 to 6 a.m. or something. I was working in like downtown Calgary last year during the playoffs. So, miserable. Maybe, what a miserable... maybe it's your boss. Maybe your boss just hates you. I, I, he does say he hates me every day. That's weird. <laughs> I'm like, love you. And he's like, I hate you. I don't know. I'm like, I'm a banter. It's funny. <laughs> I'm going to electrocute you one of these days, Mick. Ah. <laughs> <I'd be laughs> he always gets. Yeah, I'd be shocked if you did. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so kind of dropped the ball a little bit, but, you know, we're back. And, I mean, we also do have the disclaimer of our show could just end at any point for no apparent reason, so. This this is the most commitment we've actually ever offered to our viewers, because normally it's left on a season-ending cliffhanger mm-hmm. where we just never talk again. Mm-hmm. We did We avoided that pitfall this year, and here you are listening to... Well, it's going to be some gentle sobbing by the time we get to the end of this thing. But me and Mick talk about two of our favorite teams in all of sports and just how badly it's gone over the last couple of weeks. Boo. Boo. Yeah, and I'm almost glad that I don't have recordings of me being a pompous asshole the last two weeks. So, like, I can kind of live in the the joy of just being like, I didn't lose my integrity. (laughs) Yeah. And the best part about self-respect is that even when you're wrong, you're never honest enough with yourself to be like, I was so wrong about this. Yeah, you can kind of have that, like, ignorance is bliss approach with yourself. It's nice. It's quite nice. Mm. So with that, though, uh, this is the first time listening to the show. Odd choice. Odd starting point. Uh, maybe, <laughs> well, I mean, don't go back and listen to our old shows, because we're we'll be like, oh, man, the Leafs and Oilers are definitely winning Stanley Cup. <laughs> Stupid idiots. <laughs> I will say, though, those... Those opinions wasn't the worst take at the time. Both teams were atop the futures board. They both looked good. Mm-hmm. They just fucking got railroaded in the second round for some reason. I, what we're going to do today is we're going to run through some headlines. So there's some big overarching uh, narratives going on in sports uh, and just hockey world. So we'll talk on those. We'll do some postmortems on the Leafs and Oilers, kind of talk it through the last couple of weeks, just, just from a fan's point of view. Do a look ahead. Uh, as well as weeks ago, start, end of the regular season, we're on this podcast, and we're like, I got nothing to do the rest of the day. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to run an EH, an NHL EA Sports simulation of the playoffs, just to see what happens, right? Hmm. I, I don't remember exactly what happened, but I do know that the Boston Bruins, they lost to the Florida Panthers in the simulation. The Florida Panthers would go on to beat the Toronto Maple Leafs in the second round. Carolina, however, got the upper hand and ended up beating the Vegas Knights in the Stanley Cup Finals to win their second cup in franchise history. Are you Again, fucking kidding me? The Seattle Kraken also beat the, Ava- the Colorado Avalanche in this s- scenario. I'm looking at this, and I looked, and I said, what a... what Stupid. This is dumb. Like, you know, like, I wish it was more realistic 
because then I could have taken that and ran with that on some future boards, threw in a playoff pool somewhere, right? And I'm like, this is so far-fetched. Never happened. Not a chance. No way. I think it might have been 100% accurate. <laughs> Man. This is, so the timing of this couldn't be better with the emergence of AI and all this other chat GPT goofy shit going on. Maybe you have a system that is just so connected to the deep network, it actually knows how the simulation is going to play out. And I know that you've spent a lot of time over the last few years building karma in the universe. Maybe the universe has gifted you a time-telling PlayStation. Maybe, maybe this is the world we live in. I wonder if I get. I wonder if it's saved somewhere. Probably. Like, if I went into, like, old files and loaded it, I could probably actually go through. Maybe I'll post that on Twitter later if I can find that information. So, check it. Keep an eye out on Twitter, and I'll show you, like, my time my time predicting PlayStation. You know, I... What's a good litmus test? I was gonna say we could do, like, NBA playoffs, but that's already... If, it, if it's that... It wouldn't be so much foreshadowing now, because it already knows what happens. Maybe play out a baseball season. If you have a baseball game, play out the baseball season. See what it says. Sweet. It's going to be great. Vernon Wells is MVP. Boop, boop. Go Jays. <laughs> oh, man. So, when was the last time Vernon Wells played in the majors? Do you have, like, MLB MVP, like, 2012? Is that is that where you gave up on baseball video games? I, I was just pulling a random Blue Jays. I was like, who's someone who used to play for the Blue Jays? Well, that must been a while ago. Yeah, like, 2000 NHL... 07 or something maybe hmm. yeah Vernon Wells you don't talk hear about that guy very often do you no you sure don't gotta bust out the SNES for the Vernon Wells takeaway nice that's, that's all he's got like a, a solid like 88 overall and cool oh boy future right there future of Vernon Wells uh, other headlines that aren't predicting video game predicting time machines uh, what has happened we had a draft lottery and what happened i believe that the chicago blackhawks won uh, tank, uh, i have one very pointed question that i have to ask you did or do the chicago blackhawks deserve the first overall pick did they deserve to win the draft lottery all right so i think we i went off uh, our last podcast talking about the vengeful hockey gods and how we have the scandalous Boston Bruins. We, they, you know, uh, we had some scandals in the Avalanche, and I said there was no justice. Both those teams ended up actually losing that weekend afterwards, and I was like, oh, maybe there is some justice. Chicago Blackhawks still in some type of controversy. Should they have had this pick taken away from them? Should they have had harder sanctions from the league put upon them uh, instead of being down for a year and a bit? training some players and ending up with Connor Bedard? Absolutely not. They did not deserve them. Uh, do I understand why the NHL potentially rigged it? And before they actually revealed anything, I believe Kevin Weeks on NHL Network or something like that clearly said, he's like, oh, it looks like the Blackhawks won the, won the draft lottery. <laughs> it throws back to Bill Daly and he's in there and he's like, and the Blackhawks win the draft lottery. Oh, that's weird. How did Kevin Weeks know? <laughs> Almost like someone told him. Uh, does that seem fucking suspect? Yes. Kind of in the worst way. I, I didn't even know about the Kevin Kevin Weeks bit, but it feels like... And I remember you saying this whenever it is we recorded that podcast. It'd be like, this would be the most hockey thing to happen would be if the Blackhawks deserved all of this. Or they won all this despite all this bad shit they've done over the years and I can't help but think that this is this is just getting to the point where when you keep seeing the same thing over and over again you can't keep believing in coincidence like Chicago n for what they've accomplished over the years they were a dynasty the Chicago Blackhawks were without question a dynasty but here we are you know, a few years past their, their glory days, and they're already back on the upswing. You know how long it takes regular franchises to do this? Like, look at San Jose. Arguably, San Jose peaked in the early 10s. Like, ten, maybe mid-10s. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I think they had a cup run in 15, something like that. They are still shit, and they will be shit for many years to come. Mm -hmm. 
but Blackhawks being potentially an original six franchise, you know, big market team, it was just like, it, it just feels like the NHL's trying to expedite their turnaround and be like, you know what, you had Patrick Kane, you had Jonathan Taves, guess what? Here's the next big thing, Connor Bedard, and you guys are basically back to being competitive in, in the Central Division, almost with this player alone. Yeah, and, and I mean, outside of, like, do any of these other teams deserve it? Like, did I want to see him go to San Jose? Did I want to see him go to Anaheim? Not really, right? Like, I mean, I guess he just gets lost in the shuffle of if he's a good player that plays in California that we never talk about or think about, right? I uh, definitely don't want to see him go to Montreal because I just didn't want to have to deal with that fan base being happy. So that, that's exciting. Uh, like Columbus, do I really want to see Johnny Goudreau be rewarded for his bad behavior? Not necessarily, right? And, like, Arizona definitely did not deserve him. So just looking at the top couple picks here, I don't know where the right team was. And, I mean, at least I mean, he's not in our divisions. Sure, go nuts. Maybe he's not as good as he thinks, too. I mean, look look at Alex Lafreniere. Remember when that guy lit the world on fire? He looked all world. You know, he single-handedly won a gold medal for Canada in that uh, gold medal game or it was like a Monday afternoon or Sunday afternoon whatever that was right he's done nothing in New York so sometimes these guys don't pan out uh, it, there's a lot of work to just he's now a great player right so and Chicago's shit right now in terms of <laughs> what their roster looks like so there's a lot of work to do with that uh, we'll see what happens it's not it's not set in stone it's not like this is they're, they're gonna go win a cup right that there's still a lot of work to do it's a great piece so I, I stand by my original conviction, and that is that Connor Bedard, Montre the Montreal Canadiens probably deserved the top pick more than anybody else. And I know you disagree with that. And, like, the bubble life, I know, or the bubble playoffs, I know, still don't, still don't sit right with you. But I, I wholeheartedly believe just the, the way that McDavid landed in Edmonton and Matthews in Toronto, it just felt like... Montreal was the team that naturally kind of deserved this pick. That's right. Well, and speaking of like the bubble playoff, Chicago, one of their cups, of their three cups, came on that shortened season, and that always kind of seemed suspect too, right? Like I never truly gave Chicago three cups, right? They have like 2.5. It's like Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay's bubble cup, I don't think counts. Just like Chicago's lockout cup doesn't really count. They played like 40 games and then one of their postseason completely healthy. That's not how that's not how it works, right? Like, it's supposed to be a grind. It's supposed to be a long, strenuous process, right? So, and I agree. And there's no, yeah, like when we talk, we talked about it on the podcast before. Teams peaking at the right time. There's no need to peak in a 40 game season. You can run train the entire time. Like, yeah. there's almost nothing to worry about. So, a little discredit there. So we'll see. Uh, do I like? Yeah, again. It would have been nicer if one of the lesser teams would have been rewarded, right? Like, maybe not Montreal, maybe not Chicago, but, yeah, I don't know, maybe Anaheim, Columbus. It would have been fun. But you had mentioned players that kind of get lost in, in Southern California, some of the Sun Belt states. Mm -hmm. You know who's not going to get lost in the Sun Belt state? Austin Matthews, because he is never going to play with the Arizona Coyotes. I don't... It would be really difficult for him to play for the Coyotes right now very 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 difficult uh, as Grant alluded to there was a vote this week uh, the fine people of Glendale is it Glendale no it's the other one Tempe is it Tempe Tem yeah it's Tempe uh, they had a vote saying do you want us to build a new sports complex to keep this great NHL franchise and the people came out and said no <laughs> we really don't want to spend any money on this we don't want a new arena uh, and it's kind of writing on the wall. That was kind of the last straw. Gary Bettman's uh, decade-long project, two-decade, three-decade-long project to kind of get hockey in the desert might be over. I hope it's over. But I I got Gary Bettman, I promise you, is still jerking off to Carolina and Florida in the Eastern Conference Final. I promise you that. And the only thing that would have made him tug harder if it would have been Vegas and Seattle, his two expansion franchises... I guarantee you that guy would have been a cummy mess at the end of all that tugging because he would have just been so proud of himself. Nevertheless, we are talking about a Coyotes team that has gone bankrupt, that has lost their arena, that started playing in a college arena, that now has nowhere left to play. Like, 
How did the league fucking bung this one up so badly? Well, I mean, part of the reason is because they... And I don't want to say there was any missed calls in any games in any series, but there seemed to be an anti-Canadian bias that pushed some teams further into the playoffs than probably there should have been. And you end up with Florida and Carolina in the conference finals. That no one's watching. Did you watch the game that went four overtimes the other night? I didn't watch. Like, I imagine yes. viewership is probably fucking shit right now. And guess what? Either of those teams in the finals, no one fucking cares, right? Like, no one fucking cares about these teams. And that's how you end up with terrible, like, with no money at the end. It's because you're promoting teams and markets that they don't want to put money into. And that's that's exactly the point that I was trying to illustrate. Is like the, the NHL has sunk so much into the Arizona Coyotes that they're like they were just so ignorant to everything around them. They were just saying this is this team is going to work here, and they were proven wrong time and time and time again. And now they're left with a team that effectively has no home. So, like, if you're Gary Batman, and I can assure you, you'd probably do a better job. Would you pull the trigger right now to just be like, "All right, let this, let's get this team fucking out of here. Let's move them somewhere else." <laughs> or, and if so, I guess where's this team going? They are in such a tight spot right now. For example, if you wanted an NHL team, you're probably paying. What did? Vegas go for a billion dollars I, I don't something. know the numbers I, I should have looked at this beforehand I apologize but like Seattle what did Seattle go for it was something like 1.2 billion dollars was the expansion let's just let's say those are the numbers so uh, to get a, a brand new team that has no baggage that we've seen have playoff success early on right Vegas their first year they went to the Stanley Cup final since then they've kind of been playoff tried tested and true right they are staples of of the playoffs we've seen seattle seattle almost made it to the eastern or the western conference finals this year right just based on the fact that they don't really have superstars they pay a lot of second and third liners and they can just roll on you repeatedly right they have uh instead of the superstar defenseman that you're paying nine million dollars to that suck they don't have those commitments yet right like they kind of are just like this pure fan base so as a person who wants to own a team why wouldn't you pay the expansion fees to get to a whole new hall of players and almost guaranteed early success, right? You don't have commitments to these long, uh, you know, these decade-long commitments. Uh, I, I have Cap Friendly pulled up here with the Coyotes, and, like, injured reserve, they're paying Shea Weber for the next four seasons. They're paying L Brian Little, Jakob Voracek for the next two seasons. Like, why would you want to take on Shea Weber's 37-year-old dead contract at this point when for what you're going to pay for the Coyotes anyways, you're getting a whole new clean slate, right? So it's damaged goods. I don't know if anyone wants the Coyotes at this point. Like, where are you relocating them? If you're a Houston owner, are you really like, oh, yeah, bring this damaged goods into my team? No, just wait. Wait a couple years, pay your expansion fee, get a brand new team. So I don't know what you do, in fact. I, I, I don't have a good answer, right? I'm looking at this being like, they bumped this up good. And the reason I pulled up Cap Friendly, too, because, I mean, there's there's a lot of young kids right now that are probably like, do you think Clayton Keller? Do you think Lawson Kraus? Do you not, do you not think those guys are being like, I don't really like this situation. Like, what's the future? Do I want to be here anymore? Maybe I need out this summer. I got two things to add to that. First of which, you fucking keep Shea Weber's name out of your mouth. Second of which, for a guy who buys a lot of dented cans... I would never in a million years want anything to do with the the Arizona Coyotes or whatever it is they become. That being said, I think that there are a couple of hungry French or hungry, hockey hungry cities that would just kill for a team. And specifically, I don't think that we should look past Quebec City as a viable landing spot for these guys. Are you fucking telling me? Quebec City, which draws like 18,000 to the Quebec Ramparts, which is a CHL team, can't do better than 3,000 people that they're getting at the Arizona State University Stadium? Even a team like... And I, it would fucking absolutely pain me if we ended up in Texas with another team like Houston to just be like, yeah, guess what? We're going to move this, you know, 400 miles this way to Texas or, yeah, oil-rich Texas and have a completely different outcome, it feels a little disingenuous. So, best case scenario, 
Arizona, at least from my in my opinion, best case scenario, they end up in Quebec because that team, that city deserves something to look forward to other than poutine and snow eight months of the year. And I, and I could see that move. I Yeah, is this this is kind of the, the, the thrasher situation, right, where they didn't renew the, the arena. They decided, no, no, this team's done. And it was an overnight decision almost, right? Like people in the thrasher's organization, I remember listening to a podcast, that was like Tim and Sid back in the day. And they actually had a guy call the ticket, the season ticket office for the Thrashers the day of the announcement and call about season tickets. And the girl's like, yeah, for sure, certainly. Like, what seats are you looking at? What section? And he's like, like, season tickets for next season. I can purchase this. Like, yeah, absolutely. Like, what what, what are you buying? She's like, you don't, you don't, you don't get the news, honey? And she's like, what do you mean? Like, they announced that they're moving to Winnipeg next season. So you probably don't have a job. And you hear this woman very awkward being like, hold on. And like, hang up the phone. So that's how the news was broken. That the Atlanta Thrashers was like bits off of old podcasts, right? So, sure, if that if that's the solution, if that's how Quebec gets a gets a team, maybe that's the only solution. Is a team from Quebec comes in and says, "We will take them off your hands. Look, we can put them in this arena. We can get them going. We can have a new arena. Let's go." <laughs> hmm. However, if that happens. Should the Arizona Coyotes technically, this team, not technically be moved to Winnipeg, and then Winnipeg Jets technically move to Quebec City, just to keep the nice continuity of what's going on? That would be the ultimate flex. We'd be like, we'll buy the Winnipeg Jets if Winnipeg, Winnipeg best buys the Coyotes. And imagine, like, if they threw enough money, they'd be like, we'll give you $2 billion for the Winnipeg Jets. We want the Winnipeg Jets. And then you can move the old Winnipeg Jets back to Winnipeg. Uh, and that would... the, the other issue, I think, with that, just off the top of my head, uh, is conference balance. You'd have to do some type of shifting, right? Because you'd then have uh, 17 teams in the East and only 15. So you'd have to, you'd have to move someone. That, that was going to be my last piece on the Arizona Coyotes. I was like, it would, in this hy- hypothetical scenario where they end up in Quebec City, necessitate realignment. And which team... Which team would you trade conferences? And you can't, like, obviously it can't be, like, Eastern Seaboard. Like, it just, it wouldn't work. So you're looking, like, central-ish. Like, which team? Is Detroit going back to the central? And I don't know American geography well enough, but Columbus? Columbus was one that I was like, and that feels more like a a one-for-one trade, because, like, both teams kind of fucking suck. Like, I I would look forward to playing either team because I know you guys are pretty much just trash. Yeah, so like, right. yeah, they were Detroit, right? And it, it but it, it, there's a lot of moving pieces, right? But yeah, like at this point, in the next couple of years, just pack up your bags. Let's get these guys out of the desert. It's failed. It's lost. Austin, you had your chance. You fucked up, buddy. You fucked up. You signed too long of a deal. You should have went to the Coyotes last year. What were you doing? Yeah, and. The worst part now is that Kyle Dubas can't even trade him there, so... No, that's it, that's it. Uh, so those are the big news stories. We have uh, that, that. The Senators, uh, looked like the Senators, the group led by Ryan Reynolds, tried some type of weird negotiating tactic where they wanted exclusivity. They wanted, they said, look, we want to come in and we want to be the exclusive deal. Uh, we want to know what everyone else is offering. We want to have the ability to match it. And they said, that seems like bad shady business practice and they ended up actually basically getting rid of the uh, his led group so Ryan Reynolds will not be an owner of the Ottawa Senators and I haven't really heard anything about the other groups right there's four or five offers on the table and they're kind of just going through and pawing through percentage groups and stuff like that so it looks like the Ottawa Senators will be having new owners next year the sale will probably go through however you won't get a very handsome very funny face leading your team which is probably a shame in terms of like bad off seasons that teams could be having not having ryan reynolds in a press box all year as your selling feature right doesn't seem like the best outcome for the senator sale it's not the best outcome for them either or so for me either because i've spent a lot of time on social media simping to ryan reynolds with the goal of being like you know what i could be a drunk analytics guy and hang out with Ryan Reynolds. Guess what? I wasted a lot of time in nudes on trying to get his attention. So it wasn't meant to be. But, you know, we a few weeks ago, maybe it was a couple months ago, they had mentioned, like, 
the benefit of star power. And I'm not saying that's what drew Ryan Reynolds in, mm -hmm. but to have like that marquee name that's driving a bid, I think does make a difference. And I think that was part of the strategy early on when I can't even remember what the name of the group was, drew in Ryan Reynolds to be like, here, we want star power. We want a big name attached to this brand. You know who he was replaced with? Donovan Bailey. I read on TSN one of the new groups that's, or one of the remaining groups that has a bid, they've lured Donovan Bailey in to be their face, the big name. I was like, no, I fucking, I, I love Donovan Bailey. Atlanta 96 will always be one of my most cherished sports memories. 9.84 seconds. Never forget it. I actually don't give a flying fuck what Donovan Bailey is doing in 2023. And the fact that we've gone from Ryan Reynolds a total A-lister, down to Donovan Bailey, no disrespect. Again, he's a fucking gold medalist. He could probably knock me out cold. We're talking like E or maybe even F-list celebrity with Donovan Bailey. At best, he's like a Canadian C. At best. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not what you want. It's a rough look and big downside. And yeah, just one of those things where I, I hope some Canadian team has a good off season. I don't know who it is yet, though. Everyone just seems like they're getting beat down a little bit. There's not a lot of good news coming out of Canadian hockey, so. No, there really isn't. I guess did Brad for living out in Calgary? I was going to say, know. did we talk about the Calgary Arena deal on the podcast? Because that was somewhat recent. Yeah, but that's also maybe the proposal is in. There's also provincial election that comes in, like, two weeks. And... I'm pretty sure there's a certain government that will probably just squash it and be like, no, we don't spend money on those things. So, hmm. yeah. Yeah, potentially. But so the the provincial commitment was more to infrastructure. It was like tunnels, trains, buses, that sort of thing. As I, I still can't believe that the city is paying most of these costs. The professional sports team that draws in millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue every year is paying $40 million to have a new arena built, which I don't know how they pulled the city's pants down and bent them over the barrel, but they did it, and it worked. Yeah, and, and, and like, tea leaves, yeah, great, this means the flames will be in Calgary forever. You're not the owner of your building? as a franchise and that was like that was the big point of the 04 lockout right was these teams were all tenants no one owned their buildings and, and that has changed in a lot of markets but the fact the flames again a, a pretty powerful you would think franchise is is going to be a majority basically they're just paying rent right they built a brand new complex they're just going to pay, pay rent and we hope that we keep them around but like i don't know i don't like this i don't like the smell on that one honestly the minute i fucking heard arizona was likely done in Tempe, my first thought was, we should have fucking just gassed the flames. We should have said, fuck you, go find someone else to build you an arena. Mm -hmm. And then we could have got the Arizona Coyotes for fucking free. Very, very true. You could have just had a building and then like, what do you guys, what do you guys have? Here, bring them in. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know. There you go. So that's kind of, I think that wraps up most of the headlines of things pop up. Uh, but then I what I think we're at is we have four series that wrapped up. We're down to just four teams, but the four teams that left our lives, I think we, have, we owe a little bit of a, a, a eulogy. So do you want to start East? Hit the other East series. Uh, Florida, Carolina beats New Jersey 4-1. They stomped them basically outside of that one game, and it might have been, well, it was a blowout, right? When New Jersey won game three or whatever it was, they won those like 5-2. to two. They had a little bit of life, but just didn't have the experience, the guts, the playoff truculence needed to get past the Hurricanes. So poor little New Jersey Devils. This was, this was a curious series to me because I don't know where the lines opened, and that is the series price lines, but I do know that the Devils closed as favorites, which seems, in retrospect, a little fucky. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, at the time, seeing what I had seen in the first round, I was like, Man, the Devils as short favorites kind of makes sense. Now, looking back, is like playoff experience obviously was a big thing. Goaltending, we can't discount. And we saw just how assertive Carolina can be on both ends of the ice. So when all of that was said and done, like retrospect is whatever. But 
It was valuable experience for the Devils, and I think that we're going to see if they can solidify their goaltending, get a little bit more out of it. I don't know what this situation is, like cap-wise. And I don't even, isn't McKenzie, because McKenzie Blackwood, is he injured? Anyways, all of that's to say, the Devils are a force to be reckoned with. They're not done. They have that one, that bitter playoff experience, which will hopefully, you know, next year we'll be talking about as experience and the, making them an even tougher out in the playoffs. There you go. Uh, I mean, the only thing I, I know that kind of stands out from that series was uh, Lindy Ruff, who was the coach of the Buffalo Sabres, a damn good Buffalo Sabres team. If you go back and you look at that one, you get your Daniel Gruyers, you have your like Max Muffinikanoffs, you have, I'm pretty sure, uh, a younger, a young-ish Ryan Miller at the peak of his game. Uh, they lost to, I think it was a puck over the over the uh, glass penalty in Carolina, which sent Carolina onto the finals. So Lindy Ruff, game five, having a puck over the glass, which set up the winning goal against his team. Apparently it stung a little bit, so there you go. So time is a flat circle, pain is inevitable, and you're forced to relive your worst memories. Hockey's great. Yeah, hockey is great. That's why they weren't the only team that was left with a bad taste in their mouth after the second round, though. They were not, no. So we go back, uh, we flip up a little bit, and we get to the, there we go. I'm wearing the hat, I'm wearing that. Uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs made a series, being down 0-3. Uh, they got basically stomped. They had a similar effect, 4-1, against the Florida Panthers. <laughs> There's lots of unpack there. Now, Florida came back from a three, being three down, down 3-1 against the Boston Bruins. One of the best teams ever in regular season chalked the Boston Bruins franchise uh, and set them back, right? Like, that's one of those teams where they're now looking at uh, a tough offseason, too, and you're looking at leaders like Patrice Bergeron, who was kind of injury-plagued towards the end there, uh, who was thinking about retirement last year, guys, and he came back for one last kick of the can. Have we, have we, are we never going to see Patrice Bergeron on the ice again in the Boston Bruins jersey? Because we're close to that point. Uh, you know, they sure, they have a Vesna-winning goalie and Linus Allmark, but was he there when they needed him? Not really, right? So we have this flying high... Uh, Florida Panther, underdog Florida Panther team facing off the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, we last talked game six Saturday night. Overtime, John Tavares has the series winning goal in overtime. It was electric, had people over. We were all wearing our Leafs jerseys. We were cheering. I was running on adrenaline and hung over the next day. I was running in the park crying. Oh my gosh. It was a great day of emotion. And then they proceeded just to get outworked, outchanced, and well, actually that's that's a lot. They had a lot of pucks hit crossbars, they had a lot of a goalie basically standing on his head for four games, and they went home early, so. The, I, there's so much I want to touch on, I'll, I'll try and narrow it to as few points as I can. Boston. We were talking about Boston at the start of, we weren't, but pundits were talking about Boston at the start of this season being past their prime. They were way down the futures board, and lo and behold, they had 82 games left in them. I think that we're going to see the exact opposite next year. I think that they're going to be like, oh, we discounted this Bruins team, and look what they did. They're going to be the best again, and they're going to actually be shit. I think it's going to be Linus Allmark's not going to be doing what he did. We're not going to see Patrice Bergeron can recapture the magic that late in his career, even if he's back. Um, and then I think, you know... Brad Marchand, I fucking hate the guy. He still showed that he had it this year, but I don't think, I think that, um, I think he's running out of gas. Well, and like, not only that, but like, I'm pretty sure the Pasternak contract now kicks in. Like, he's now making double figures, I think, isn't he? Mm, I wouldn't know off the top of my head. Boston Bruins. Right, so that, that's just going to add a lot to the fact that was too. He was only making $6 million. Yeah, he makes 11.2425 next year. That changes a lot. You know, when you start getting those double-figure guys, you need to kind of be there. Uh, the fact that you're now paying that much to one of your top-end guys. That's not to say that he doesn't deserve it, I, I, but I yeah. agree with you 100%. He Because now, all of a sudden, it's like, well, nah, maybe the cap goes up. I still think that it's, it's, it's coming from an Oilers fan. When you have a couple big contracts, it does make it more challenging. The other thing I wanted to mention, Florida Panthers are not as good as their record implies. They've basically been outplayed in virtually every game. And 
for some reason they're still like way up on the like they're up on the futures board, maybe rightfully so. Mm-hmm. You beat Carolina at home in game one. This team, their metrics are actually piss poor, and I say it every fucking year. You see a hot goaltender carry a team further than they get, deserve to go, and it just blows my mind that this year it's fucking Sir Sergey fucking Bobrovsky is that guy. Like, oh, a million bucks. There you go. <laughs> And the only thing that's keeping me sane right now, like, I can accept that Florida, Matthew Kachuk, Sergei Bobrovsky, they could potentially win the Cup. The only thing that is keeping me sane is that we see it every year. You're paying for this year's success with next year's metrics, and everything's going to come collapsing down on them. So, anyways, enjoy the run, Florida. If you have it all in you this year, great. But I have a feeling this house of cards is going to tumble, if not by the end of this postseason, in the next year. Yeah. <clears throat> and then lastly, the Toronto Maple Leafs. What are, I can't even imagine the roller coaster of emotion you and other Leafs went, Leafs fans went through over the past couple of weeks. Yeah. It was like this this moment. <laughs> the Icarus analogy probably applies. You flew way too close to the sun. It was like we finally did it. We got over the mountain and. Fate loves irony, and we want Florida chance. You kind of got what you deserved, and well, okay, all right. And I mean, people are shitting on Leafs fans for saying that. You know why no Florida fans were being filmed chanting anything? <laughs> I know where this is going. <laughs> so, like, let, let's just call it like it is. You're like, oh, look how shitty the Flames Leafs fans. They wanted the the eighth best team that came in the playoffs. Yeah, no shit. Of course you wanted that over the Boston Bruins, the best team ever. And everyone's like, oh, well, that really upset the Florida. I was like, they were motivated by fans? Because they've never been motivated by what their fans have said before. Like, no one's fucking Florida Panthers fan. Get the fuck out of here. They were bullied out of their arena by the Miami Heat. They said, you guys have to play in the afternoon if you want to play because the Heat are playing that night and they're more important than you in this arena. So you do whatever the fuck they say. So there was extra added delays to their stupid schedule because of that so fuck you you don't even have the weight to throw your like even have a say to say oh we believe we should do this like no first and foremost Miami Heat no one cares about the Florida Panthers we'll find you a spot after our rappy concert on Sunday afternoon maybe you can play a game or something like that like get the fuck out of here don't you dare be smirch Raffy. Raffy is (laughs) Canadian icon (laughs) like what are we doing here guys like oh the Florida Panthers they were upset the no get out of here like and, and, and again no I don't want to belittle the Florida Panthers. The Florida Panthers are a good team. Uh, if you look back over the last, I actually did this at one point five, three to five years, the Florida Panthers have had the sixth, seventh best record over the last five years. So with this core, they are actually have been pretty good. They won the President's Trophy last year, and they traded for MVP candidate Matthew Kachuk, and everyone's acting like this team doesn't deserve to be in the playoffs. They fought and they scraped all season. We made fun of them. We laughed. They were in the 20s overalls right like they barely made it into the postseason they played meaningful hockey for months months and months and months when was the last time that the boston bruins played a meaningful playoff game or a meaningful hockey game when was the last time the toronto maple leafs played a meaningful hockey game not like literally boston's was probably game one of the season and then game seven of the first round right the toronto maple leafs outside of october had a pretty easy time. Like, it was really easy to get Toronto Maple Leafs and to play hockey in Toronto, and there wasn't a lot of pressure up until, uh, like, elimination games against the Tampa Bay Lightning, right? So you have, you play a week of meaningful hockey versus a team that's been fighting and scrapping as a group for the last two, three months. Of course, you're going to have some upsets, right? And, again, Bobrovsky's been standing on his head. He did it the other night against Carolina, the clearly better, superior team, and they pull an upset, right? Like, it just, they have puck luck on their side, and I personally wouldn't have blown things out of proportions, right? Toronto, I said it in game one and two, man, Tampa Bay is a good team. God damn. Like, watching the Florida Panthers try and play hockey versus what Tampa Bay is giving you out on the ice, that level of compete, that level of grit, that level of professionalism, Tampa Bay is a damn good hockey team, man. And Florida does not have the jock straps to even hang on the same ice as those guys. And they're still playing hockey, and they're seven wins away from a Stanley Cup at this point. I realize that, but, like, I kind of feel like the reality is going to crash down at some point, right, for this team. I agree. If not this year, the next. Yeah. But you know what? This is the you know what the truest indictment of Florida's success is. 
the Winnipeg Jets are a fucking terrible hockey team. And I say this because Paul Maurice literally abandoned ship. He was the guy, Mm -hmm. the captain who you hear about who left all the drowning passengers on the boat, and he's like, fuck you guys, I'm hopping on this diggy, I'm out of here. Off he went. Now, he's landed in Florida, and as Mick mentioned, a good hockey team, a competitive hockey team loaded with talent. Let's not discredit and be critical of the Florida Panthers, who again, a good hockey team. They're well constructed, they've got some good fucking players on that team, right? And Paul Maurice, there you go. Very smart on the ice, right? But and this is what he does. Paul Maurice, he's like he looks he's he takes teams on on playoff run. <laughs> Maybe not the Winnipeg Jets, mm-hmm. although they did was it a conference finals they made it to? They had they won a couple. Yeah, it was Vegas that first year they lost to Vegas in that first yeah. That was kinda so And then he did it with Carolina back in the day. Here he is doing it with Florida. Mm-hmm. The Winnipeg Jets, you were you were terrible, and you really hurt Paul Maurice's feelings so much that he was just like, I can't do this with you anymore. Mm-hmm. But I'm glad he landed on his feet. That is, like, I will say, probably the glimmer of hope that I will take from the P- Florida Panthers run mm-hmm. is that I'm glad P- Paul Maurice is doing well. They have, like, pieces they like. I like Aaron Eckblad. You know, I don't love Matthew Kachuk. I, I respect what he does on the ice, though, right? Like, I... So it's one of those things, I don't hate them, they're boring. And no one cares, no one cares about you. Uh, last note on the Leafs before we move to the West. Yeah, uh, all the good graces, all the uh, that this team acquired in the first round, winning that playoff series, kind of negated by their piss-poor performance against Florida. Again, very, 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 very close. Outside of a minute, a couple turnovers uh, in Game 2 of that series, they, they were kind of in the driver's seats. They had tons of chances, and they just were on the wrong side of every single shot, it seems. Uh, bad favors. Kyle Dubas had an emotional press conference earlier this week. Came on saying it was hard on my family. Apparently it was a negotiating tactic. Came back, uh, almost had a deal in place. At the last minute, asked for like, it was like one to two million dollars extra on top of the deal. Shanahan basically told him to get the fuck out of here. Slammed the door in his face. And now the Maple Leafs have a very big off season. Uh, they've got some important decisions to make what they're doing with the core four. Do they move one of these key pieces? Um, they got to find a new general manager, probably a new coach. It's going to be a big offseason. Uh, and as a Leafs fan, I'm kind of ready for it. I think we've seen the apex of what this team can bring and how it's constructed on the ice and where Kyle Dubas' mind was at. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited that we get a new perspective. And this is Steve Eiserman building a great team in Tampa Bay, moving on to Detroit and having someone else come and basically finish the job. We've seen this before in sports, right? So I'm expecting the next guy that comes in, you don't have a lot of leg room. Basically, you got to just tinker, move out some bad pieces, and you're probably pretty close, right? So I still think we'll see probably some quality play from the Toronto Maple Leafs, and it's just going to look and feel a little bit different in the next year or two. I can't believe that this is where we land. Like, I can't believe that this is how it ended. Mm -hmm. And that is after years of playoff disappointment, and I said this, I was so sure last year. I was like, if they lose in the first round, Kyle Kyle Mm Dubas is gone. We talked about it. I was like, if this happens again, and you said, even with a first-round playoff series, it would probably take a sweep in the second round for Kyle Dubas to lose Mm -hmm. his job. And that's effectively what we saw. Like, five games... Sure, it's basically a sweep. The way that you lost is, well, I will say it's akin to a sweep. Mm-hmm. But as I was reflecting more on this, because I did think that like heads needed to roll, somebody needed to lose their job for this. You can't mm-hmm. continue to do the same song and dance, and have people, you know, still enthusiastic about the outcome. So when Kyle Dubis, when it was announced, was it yesterday? I think it tripled yeah. in yesterday that he wasn't coming back. At first, I was like, I fucking saw this coming. And then my first initial reaction was like, why? After seeing his shrewdness with moves and, like, bringing in those pieces year after year, I think that this is less on Dubis, and I think it's more on the locker room. And obviously that ties back to Dubis, but I think we need to see some, like, a wholesale change among the the core group of forwards here. And that's probably hard to hear as a Leafs fan. I'm not against change at this point because it's not working. 
right? Uh, we've seen it. Uh, there was a lot of tinkering. And, like, yes, they were good moves, but there was a lot of tinkering at that deadline, right? McCabe's around for a while, sure. Luke Shen was definitely a big body that you needed. You know, helped unlock, unlock Morgan Riley in the playoffs, but, like, there was just a lot of tinkering. And there's always a lot of tinkering, right? And, and you're right, they needed to change something. Uh, it's a lot easier to... Apparently he was he was in. Like if you listen to the con, the, the it was up until Thursday night there was a brief discussion on some changes to what Brendan Shanahan had thought was an agreed upon contract that he did not like. He did not like the tone it was taking, and that's where he ended it. He ended up walking away with it, right? So we don't know what was said at that point, but it almost seems like they were trying as an organization to make a hard pact of saying if you're going to play here, we're going to offer you a contract, and when it's worked out, that's it. Don't, don't ask for more because we will get rid of you. There is no one greater than the symbol on the front of the jersey. So it's you got to play tough ball, hard ball somewhere, right? And losing Kyle Dubas, you did okay. Now, again, we could also sit here and we could start pointing fingers. I listened to a podcast today where they just went through some of the misgivings. Like, remember uh, the Najem Kadri for Tyson Berry trade? That's not looking so good anymore. When they, when they traded for Jared McCann last year and then gave him up in the expansion draft protect Justin Hall it doesn't that doesn't sound like a solid idea at all right so uh, there are if you go through there are lots of questionable moves that have happened right um, signings trades so uh, again excited to see kind of where they go this and, and honestly it should be uncomfortable to be a Toronto Maple Leafs they're very 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 safe and feel comfortable in that situation I want to see those guys sweat a little bit right and if it comes from moving one of the big pieces we're kind of seeing it with some of these other teams. You don't need four superstars. What you need is maybe like one or two superstars, and then you need a lot of depth, right? You need four lines that can go out there and play hockey to be successful. Um, you you know what else you need? A competent goaltender. Oh, well, that, I... that helps too, right? And like, we didn't discuss that. Samsonov was hurt against Tampa Bay. He continued to get hurt. Then he got really hurt, and then you have this kid, Joseph Wall, coming. He looked fine. Right, but really, the least at that point, you're protecting your goalie. You're not trying to win games, and you're not going to win the Stanley Cup at that point, right? So, and this is where the Leafs. This is where yeah, I think the you're, you're sitting here. You're like, Kyle Dubas should have a job. Kyle Dubas failed in nine years to get a fucking goalie for the team. So, like, maybe we're it's time to say, okay, let's get let's let's get rid of this guy and bring in someone who can go find a goalie, right? And this is like, I. People who have listened since for the past few years have heard me talk about this team just needs a fucking goalie. They just need, and like even at the start of the playoffs, like you don't even need a, a number one goalie. You need an average goalie who we'll can get, just play behind an exceptional team. We'll go get Aiden Hill. There you go. <laughs> Aiden Hill or Lauren Brassois, apparently. That's it. Or you want Logan Thompson. Oh boy. Anyway. And this is where I think the Leafs have a big advantage this offseason because if you are really talking about a wholesale change, you can pick. To me, it's it would. William Nylander really grew on me this year. I was like, I fucking every time he stepped on the ice, I was like, I really like to see what Willie Nylander brings. But I guarantee you, you could trade him for an a, an above average goaltender and probably a complimentary piece, like whether it's a second or third line winger who's going to add that scoring depth that is so valuable in the playoffs. And then all of a sudden this team goes from, you know, average to, you know, suboptimal goaltending situation to above average goaltending situation without really materially affecting their scoring. Yes. I don't, and like, I just like, like I said, I know we get attached to these people as they like, mm-hmm. you know, make memories in, in our favorite sports teams jerseys. But at the end of the day, if William Nylander m- moving on from this team gives them a goalie and another complimentary scoring piece, I think they'd be stupid not to make that trade. I've done it. I've done the math in my head too. You can't move Tavares, unfortunately. You got to let that run. Matthews. How else do you find a number one center in this league, right? Like, say what you want. I think he was also hurt. Like he took a pretty big shot to the arm at one point and then just couldn't hit the net after that point. I think he was hurt. So like, okay, we'll give him his credit. And like Mitch Marner brings so much to your team. You need, like, five guys to replace him. Yeah, he kind of goes a little, you know, white knuckly. He has some nerves in the playoffs, but, like, penalty kill alone. He's one of the best penalty killers in the league. So, like, I, I, I come back. I, Nylander's stock is really high. See what you can get for him. I, I, I agree. I think that's probably the move, and I'm excited. I'm excited to see kind of what happens because 
I, again, I'd love to watch these guys suck for the next 10 years. I'll be happy in Toronto and hold hands and cry every, you know, April or May. But we're going to get something different. That's kind of cool. Yeah. One thing, so do you have any hypothetical trades in mind? Like, if you had to move Nylander for, let's say, and you probably haven't thought about this, but if you could think of a goaltender and a winger that you could trade ne William Nylander for from one team at this moment, who would it be? Uh, so right now, I, I was looking at a couple options. I'd like, do you do more veteran? Do you go, like, John Gibson? Go to, say, Anaheim, go John Gibson plus a winger or something like that maybe a couple young pieces right here's your franchise he's a cool kid he's handsome kids can you know the ladies can get behind william nylander uh, and he, he gets along well with the development of some of your stars star centers right those troy terry's and stuff the mctavish's uh or do you look at someone like a philadelphia and say what's carter hartworth right here's a big piece you guys can build around here's kind of a big studs forward um we'll bring back kind of this young up and coming highly touted younger prospect right uh something like that off the top of my head i would be looking at kind of those markets. that's fair I, i'm not saying that he's worth it but like the columbus blue jackets have a good track record of putting together above average goaltenders so why don't you just like william neven lander for corpus Allo and like adding in like, I, there's no way you could include Lion. Like, maybe you, if there is a way you get Lion A, like a pure trigger man where you have to throw in a pick or something like that. Like, yeah. a defenseman, a prospect, something. Like, I don't know. I, I, I was I, even playing around with, like, you go to Chicago and say, look, you got Seth Jones. He makes a lot of money. He's a big body defenseman. That's that fifth piece we need for our, like, elite power play is that big, big, bad defenseman that can just push guys around. We'll give you Nylander, you retain a million, two million dollars, and you know, have a, a, a talented, experienced winger to play with the guard. You know, mm -hmm. go that way. Well, that that kind of makes sense too. I just don't know if they have and maybe maybe, you know, I, I just can't see Chicago being like, Well, we already paid two million dollars of McCabe's salary for the next two four years. Yeah, let's pay two more million dollars. Let's pay four million dollars for the Leafs defense the next nine, <laughs> eight years. That might be a that, tough pill to swallow. That would be. But I didn't think of Philadelphia. Carter Hart is an intriguing piece. So, anyways, the, I this will be an off season of change for the Toronto Maple Leafs. But my sincerest hope is that you start in October better because of it. Oh, I, I, yeah. Like at this point, I'm not even. I'm like, oh, we've seen the success that this team can bring, and like. You got to get better, so let's let's get better. Just don't make moves that make you worse, right? Like don't do things just to do things. Uh, so moving on to the West, as everyone loves, lots of Leafs talk right there in the middle. Uh, we saw the Seattle Kraken. Oh boy, they pushed Dallas right to Game Seven. Uh, they came up a little bit short, but it was a close affair, right? Like it was not a one-sided contest by any means. The Dallas Stars prevail. They move on. Seattle. Maybe the theory of high-end paying your guys, you know, paying the superstars so much and then filling out the edges, that may not be the way to build. I think if you can have second and third liners scattered throughout your lineups, maybe that's how you make a hockey team. Seattle did follow the Golden Knights blueprint with when it came to scoring, and that is up until a couple, like, the first few years of Vegas's existence, they didn't have the Mark Stone or, you know, that that preeminent goal scorer that just carried them. Like, William Carlson was the fucking guy. He, I, I'm sure I, if he wasn't the leading goal scorer, he was very close to the top of the okay. league. Yeah, yeah. So we saw Seattle follow that blueprint, and they had success with it in year two. The problem, this is a little technical, but... Dallas's zone entries are just better than anybody else's. It's absolutely insane how effectively these guys enter the attacking zone. And this kind of sums it up, and it's not even the best example, but Roop hits his goal in Game 7, where the puck kind of just dropped right at the blue line, and he picked it up, and he, like, goes in and, and top cheddar, top cheese. I can't remember who the blue liner was who got caught flat-footed. But that's what the Kraken just couldn't stop. They just couldn't stop these zone entries that let Dallas eventually thrive offensively. So I, it's not their scoring. It's like, it's maybe it's a systems adjustment. Maybe they were just beat by the better team. But like, 
they just let Dallas take the zone easily every time, and then from there it was just, well, it was all just a formality. Mm -hmm. But they do have a lot of exciting pieces, and we do see how competitive teams can be without that Leon Dreisaitl, Connor McDavid, Austin Matthews, without that big scorer. So Seattle grew on me throughout the postseason, and they were just outmatched with the Stars. I, I agree. I, I would have told you the Kraken can suck it. I hate them. They kind of have a little place in my heart right now, right? Like, I'm going to be curious. I'm going to be watching them in the offseason and following them a little more closely as a result. So they, they definitely won me over, and this is that uh, organic, right? That I kind of talked about that organic fan, fan base growing. There you go. All you need to do, they come in, they upset, you know, it's such, such the avalanche this year. Maybe they upset the Flames or the Jets or the Oilers next year in the first round of the playoffs. And also, you've got a bit of a rivalry and a bit of a spurn in everybody's side. That's kind of fun. I, I respect that. No, it's good. Uh, no, no, no shade there. Uh, Dallas... Are they the best team in that division? I don't know. Maybe. Sure. In the Central Division? Yeah. Like, do they like, deserve to be there? I guess. I guess they're... So, yes. I think Dallas deserves to be here. Because what we saw in the Central Division was them, the Wild, and the Avs were, like, neck and neck until the final two games of the season. Yeah, yeah. And then it was Colorado who had a game in hand who eventually, they basically took care of business to, to get where they yeah. got. But Dallas, man, Dallas has been so good. Defensively, they have this shell. And you know what else I respect about Dallas? And this, um, Canadian hockey fans are going to hate me for say, saying this, but Dallas's arena and Seattle's arena, uh, Seattle's arena were both better than what I saw from Flames, or sorry, from Oilers fans, from Leafs fans this postseason. They were standing the entire time, and they were cheering, and they were loud, and they were raucous. You could hear a pin drop in Edmonton, and like it was a, and again it was tense. But at the same time, you can't sit there fucking pouting about how bad your team is getting beat. Like, have some fucking pride. So Dallas, I think, watch it in Game Three. Watch how the fans stay on their feet. I guarantee you, they will probably be on their feet their entire first period, and they will be making noise the entire time. So I think that's kind of the element that. I didn't see from Oilers this year, and I, di I didn't really see it from the Leafs fans either. So, and it's just, no. I don't know, it's a different environment. And I think I Dallas know. does deserve some credit. Yeah, and it comes back to that grassroots nature of these are, you know, good old boys. They're football fans. They want to stand and cheer, and they're there to, you know, they, to encourage them. And they're not just there to, as a status, right? And I always kind of feel like that's where, like, Oilers and Leafs fans are. Like, oh, I'm at the game. Look at my, look how. Oh, I'm so fancy. I don't know. Like, it's just kind of. I don't think you get the true fan experience inside the arenas in ca Canadian markets, right? Nah, which is a shame. Speaking I... of Canadian team in the West, Oilers. Oilers beat the Kings shortly after. Was it the Sunday? Right afterwards, when they uh, game six, when they beat the Kings, like going back two weeks from our previous pod. I can't even remember to be honest. I can't remember what day that happened on. It must be close because. Because Leafs game six was the Saturday Sun night, so Oilers must have been the Sunday. I think there was a layoff. Maybe it was, anyways, was that the layoff? Was there like the, the four, I think that was the four day game. Or no, that was before game six. That was yeah, four days. Then it went to Vegas, and it was just like for no reason the game was on Friday, and then they delayed it a day to Saturday, and then there was like another three days. Okay. So, yeah. So this is a potentially unpopular opinion, and I don't care, and I don't know if people are. Other people are too fucking scared to say this, but everybody was ragging on the Oilers' depth scoring. They're like, oh, the Oilers, you know, second, third liners, Kaylor Yamamoto, Warren Fogel, yada, yada, yada. Ryan Nugent Hopkins. You know who wasn't at their best this postseason? It was Connor McDavid. Connor McDavid, sadly, was not who he was, who we expected him to be. He was neutralized by Philip Deneau, and Drew Doughty in round one. Mm -hmm. And it was Petrangelo. Well, Petrangelo kind of bullied everybody around. Maybe it was Stevenson. Mm -hmm. Anyways, we didn't see the Connor McDavid from the regular season who just put his team on the back, on his back and did what needed to be done and said, fuck you guys, I'm still going to be the best guy in the world. We saw Connor McDavid who got frustrated and basically didn't do anything at five on five. He, I'm just pulling up the stats here, but so 19 points in the postseason, and let's see here. 
Um, 12, 13 of which he, thir- so 13 of his 19 points came on special teams. So six points over two series at five on five. And people are fucking talking about him like he was the savior. And he was not. Leon Dreisaitl was the savior. Leon Dreisaitl was fucking competing night in and night out. And every time he was on the ice, I was like, this guy is better than Connor McDavid. Every every fucking game, Mick. I was like, Leon, we need more Leon. We need less Connor. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. No, I, I saw it and I felt it. And I... And he was changed. He was a changed creature, right? There was a little bit of burst in Game 2. I watched the start of Game 2 against Vegas, and him and Dreisaitl were on fire. There was one where he just walked past the defense, uh, poke-checked the puck in past the goalie, scored easily on an early power play, right? And they're like, oh, McDavid's back. McDavid showed up for this game. That was only one of their wins, right? And we're sitting here, the Oilers lose to Vegas 4-1, they only had one more postseason win than the Leafs. And people in Leafland are, like, blowing it up. Like, it is, like, the end of the world. I'm like, how are the Edmonton Oilers that much better? Like, how do they not – how do they scathe this without criticism, right? Like, they have – they're equally as flawed. They have as many issues. Uh, but I just wasn't hearing that discussion. And it was uh, – does McDavid have to learn how to play in the postseason? Or, like, did he burn himself out in the regular season? Did he just... That's – I, so, like, I don't think it's a postseason thing because we saw him absolutely run train last year. Like, Connor McDavid was Connor McDavid, and that's – he was better in the postseason than he was in the regular season. But so was Leon Dreisaitl. Leon Dreisaitl is their playoff performer, and, like, that's going to hurt Oilers fans to hear. But guess what? Leon is better in the playoffs than Connor McDavid is, and that's the reality that we need to know. But – the other thing that we have to talk about, too, is the goaltending. Because Stuart Skinner was a rookie goaltender who was expected to maybe be a backup to Jack Campbell. Instead, he was thrust into the line, like, played like he was a lead goal, like a primary goaltender, a rookie of the year candidate, and we get to the postseason and he pooped himself. And nobody should be surprised at that. Like, you have burdened this rookie goaltender to say, you're now our hope between the pipes. So... We saw him run out of gas in, I don't want to say the first round, but we saw him at times appear unstable in the first round, and then he was just on empty against the Knights. Jack Campbell came in, I think, three of the last four games. Maybe it was four of the last five. Like, they kept yanking Stuart Skinner. And, like, at a certain point, you have to acknowledge that something's just not when your goaltender has an 86 save percentage, whatever it was, Stuart Skinner's not the guy. Like, a five games, an 86, 80, 86 or lower save percentage, and you still keep going back to it, you got what you deserve, Boilers. Like, Jack Campbell, as adventurous as he is in the net, and you never quite know what you're getting with Jack Campbell, at least as an Oilers fan, we never knew what we were getting with Jack Campbell. The guy had a 960, 90, like a 96 something save percentage. He had a 1.01 goals against average. Granted, it was in relief, but that's the guy. That's the guy you lean into. I don't care if it upsets players in the dressing room. Like, you want to go with the best in the postseason? Leon Dreisaitl was the best. Jack Campbell was the best. That's what we needed more of. Yeah. Well, I mean, on the plus side, you got him for another four years, five million bucks each season. So, like, he's not going anywhere. That's great. And this is like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, pulling yeah. up the, the cap friendly here for the Oilers. Uh, goaltending, they're set. They got $7.6 million dedicated to Skinner and Campbell going forward. So kind of looks like that's a bed they're going to live in. Uh, Evan Bouchard has uh, an RFA this summer, so he's going to eat up a little bit of your cap space. And other than that, everything else is kind of set in stone, at least for a little while, right? So. It is like where we got McDavid, or sorry, was Dreisaitl two more years and McDavid's three more years, something like that. But you know what I'm most excited about? Because the biggest knock on the Oilers over the past few years is like, what's going on with your defense? Guess what? We have Matthias Ekholm and Evan Bouchard now, who I think are just everything that we ever needed. And I don't want to overstate this, but I love them, and I don't want them to go anywhere. And if they do... Take away my belts and shoelaces because I don't know if I could handle that. So I could feel that. Yeah, that one. Like looking at the, their defense, like, oh, cool, Darnell Nurse, nine point two million dollars. Like, what are you guys doing? Come on. 
Yeah, this in retrospect, that contract is like when you were talking about Seth Jones. It was like, guess what? You could just have Darnell Nurse if you want. Uh, there was there was actually there was a bunch of guys, and it was Seth Jones, Darnell Nurse. Uh, there's a couple other guys that all signed a nine plus ish range for defensemen and it was right around when they were talking to Riley and I was like this is this is awful Morgan Riley at nine million dollars is the worst thing that's ever happened Morgan Riley at seven million dollars what a steal what an absolute steal he's a number one defenseman he makes essentially the same as Ekholm I can live with that that's what defensemen should make everyone that's over that value I just don't know if they're worth it yeah they're not and this was part of that defensive like blossoming last year a couple years ago whatever it was Darnell Nurse, God bless his heart. There was times this postseason where he just looked so bad. And the, I mean, did we talk about the the overtime goal against the Kings? Anyways, there was a I can't remember whatever the maybe it was game four overtime where Darnell Nurse got caught in the defending zone for like a minute and a half. I was so I was like, man, Nurse is finally doing it. Like he finally looks like a nine million dollar guy. And then like thirty seconds later. He's facing the goalie as the player he's trying to cover is behind him, shooting the puck in the net. I was like, why? Like, how did this happen, Nurse? Like, where where did you go so badly where it's like you get turned around or you get caught and then you get turned around? And it's like, no wonder they scored. Darnell Nurse looks like just like an abomination. And it, that was the Nurse that will stick with me until I see something different because that was like... From there, all I could focus in was like Nurse is doing something wrong again, and I think that there's a. Uh, I think he, I, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, but I just can't. Not after this postseason. Not after what I saw game in and game out of what he was doing, the mistakes he was making. So, Darnell Nurse. Maybe there's a universe that he is worth nine million dollars. Best case scenario, he refines that form next year. But with Matthias Ekholm, Evan Bouchard taking on bigger power play roles, it's hard to rationalize nine million dollars on Darnell Nurse. Yeah, that, that is a rough one. That is a rough one. Uh, so yeah, they sign Bouchard. That's what the Oilers are doing this off season. And I don't know. We're we're kind of at like the insanity point with the Leafs and Oilers here. We were both projecting them to be Stanley Cup contenders right down to the wire we did not have any doubt there was no wavering in in my opinion anyways right even when it was like 3-1 I was like Leafs in 7 I could see it right like in overtime they were close so they would have won that now you're 3-2 you're back in Florida you have a lot of success in Florida Uh, you know your five fans might be kind of standing up the whole game but you could probably look past that right like I I was convinced right up into the end Uh, now I'm looking at change and with the Oilers I think it's run it back. I think it is run it back. And you want to, I was with you. The biggest bet I have made probably of the last year was the series price on Toronto when they were down to nothing. I was like, I dumped a whole bunch of money. I think it was plus two something. Yeah. I mean, it was plus 250, plus overtime. 295. They had two overtime losses and it's 3 2, right? Like in overtime, it really is a coin, like independent coin toss. Even yeah. the best team versus the worst team, it's a coin toss, right? So you have a 50% chance that you're up 3-2 and the Leafs are still playing hockey right now. I, I don't think it's as bad as either of these series. And, like, the Oilers running it back, yeah, you learn from it. How do you get better, right? McDavid, maybe you don't need to be that intense all the time. You can maybe smile. You can maybe have fun playing hockey. How about that? I also feel like Connor McDavid might be a terrible teammate because he doesn't yell at you for eating candy in the locker room and not eating only kale. He just is, like, really disappointed in you, which is sometimes worse. So, yeah, and this is where I have no issue with the Oilers running it back. The, the candy, like, whatever. If maybe Connor, I agree Connor McDavid could have more personality off the ice. Maybe he should get a little extra shouty. But the Oilers' third line was their best line this postseason. When we see, who was it? It was Bugstad... Warren Fogle and Ryan McLeod. Anytime those three teams, uh, maybe we talked about it on one of our podcasts, but they were the energy group. Mm-hmm. And then you have Dry Sidle. You have the top six being the top six. All you needed, you needed one goaltending and you needed more out of Connor McDavid or, you know, shift the balance and ask Leon Dry Sidle to, to bite off a bigger piece mm-hmm. because he was that much better. So, anyways, we'll see. Goaltending, yeah. goaltending. 
$7 million for two goaltenders, I think that's good. I can live with that. That's not terrible. Darnell Nurse, though, $9 million? Like, I just... Play like a $5 million defenseman. That's my goal next year. Darnell Nurse, be worth $5 million. Darnell, we noticed that we have, you have a no-movement clause, but you submitted 10 teams to us, and the Arizona Coyotes wasn't one of them? We were just wondering, <laughs> like, you, you could go anywhere. See, that's the thing. It's a mystery box. You go to Arizona, we trade you. You could be going anywhere, Darnell. Imagine that. Like, you could, you could move to Florida and just live there, or you could take the mystery box. And it could even be living in Florida. So, like... Endless possibilities. Mystery box, mystery box, mystery box. <laughs> mystery box. So there you go. So uh, fans, like we we're saying, you might be on the trade machine on cap friendly this weekend. Check out Lawson Krause. Check out Clayton Keller. Because I imagine those kids, they're making like six, five million dollars. Probably don't want to be in Florida. So do they make your team better? Maybe. Maybe. And that I think wraps it up. I got nothing left to say about the Oilers. No, we got. Every conversation that I've had with myself while driving around Calgary the last few weeks, I've now said with Grant on here. So, perfect. <laughs> so, we wrap up headlines. Normally, we would typically move on to, obviously, my better advice, or sorry, my dirty fantasy. I got nothing in that vein. Uh, I was going to put one, but, like, I don't know how you do one team. Yeah, and that's, like, single-game slates. Sometimes I like them, sometimes I wasn't feeling it, so... Respectful pass. We'll be back next year, maybe with new strategies. Something more, I think, both of us willing to learn more about. But better advice. We had a lot of fun with better advice this year. I had a lot of fun mm -hmm. with better advice this year. I don't even remember what bets I made last week. Do you remember yours? I had one that worked. I had one that hit. It was like a ba, 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 Rangers at Edmonton. It was a plus 175 parlay that I hit, and then obviously I put $50 on Tampa Bay to win, so that was unsuccessful. However, I did make a good amount of change betting on the perennial underdog Florida Panthers over their five-game series, and the result was the most beneficial for my finances. So them, the Leafs making that series go earlier, I would have been betting money probably out of my own personal bank account at some point, had it gone seven, to try and emotionally hedge, so them just dying when they did financially it helped me quite a bit but yeah i i think i hit that game as an overtime bet actually you did, yeah and i think i also had the oilers maybe the devil screwed me out of my parlay mm -hmm. anyways yeah i, I, I think we, we're against sides on that one so yeah you know it was a hell of a year i got a one bet left to make do you have anything if you if you had one if i said you have one one hundred dollar bet to make for the rest of the postseason. What would it be? Stanley Cup championship odds. Well, Ooh. you d yeah. dig into that. I'm gonna let you know right now. I've got one hundred dollar bet left to make. It is Carolina to win the cup. That game one loss tanked their odds. They're down to plus three hundred, I think. Yep. I was like, yes, that's it. You're getting my money, Carolina. I will. I was literally going to say I, I was looking up what Carolina's odds were for the Stanley Cup because my video game told me that they're winning. So why wouldn't <laughs> I have done this? They were actually my preseason pick too, so we went all the way back in time. I might have a preseason... Do I have a preseason future on Carolina winning? Do we both? Because I... Yeah, maybe... Anyways, I know we both thought highly of, of Carolina. Hmm. That's interesting. I have like you have to run all the way back here. Flames, Tampa, Tampa wins. Stars change. I don't see anything in my little notebook. So, if we had a, a producer, and I know I always keep going back to the producer, well, who could just whisper nice things in our ear and be like, prompt us, be like, guess what, guys? You said all this before, and you could look like geniuses, but when we leave it up to ourselves, we just like, yeah. Anyways, I'm gonna. Maybe I had, was it a Senator's pick, too? I will go back and listen to the first podcast, and I will see if anything made it in. But as it stands right now, I do think that $100 is worth betting on Carolina to win it all. Absolutely, especially at this point with some like, long-shot odds after that first game. But Barofsky's going to be exhausted. Like, like, he's not playing tonight. He can't be playing tonight. And you know what the other, I say this, like... And then it's uh, consistent, right? Like, Saturday, Monday... Wednesday, like it's just every other day. 
And I heard one of the biggest advantage Bobrovsky had was rest because he it takes so much out of him per game that the, the more frequently and consistently he plays, like historically he always just slumps down. And due to the inability of the Panthers to get actual ice time in their own arena because they're in heat, it gave Bobrovsky like much needed rest in between games. Well, now he's exhausted after game one. And you have every other day, like, yeah, let's go Carolina. Yeah, and you know, I like when I say a hot goaltender carries a team further than they deserve to go, you know what almost never happens? That team winning the Stanley Cup. So I've never said a hot goaltender has carried a team to the Stanley Cup because I can't think of a time when it happened, when a goaltender was almost solely responsible. Carey Price in 2020 in the bubble. J.S. Jaguar back in 2003 when he was crying winning the Conn Smythe. Like, Mm -hmm. those are the ones that stuck with me, whereas, like, those are, like, the classic hot goaltender further than they deserve to go, but it still wasn't enough. And I don't think that Bobrovsky is enough. I don't think that he can carry that team far enough. Binnington was close. Binnington was close, but... That team was good. Like St. Louis had, like, yeah, three lines that could score. Yeah. Like Petrangelo, Riley, like Alex Steen, like it was, it was a, yeah, it was a good squad. It wasn't. Let's not, let's not discredit how, how good that that Blues team was. Right? So, yeah, there you go. Woo! All right. Well, that wraps up better advice. And lastly, well, maybe not lastly. We're just running long here. You got anything else you got to say? Uh, I, I'm just gonna keep. I, I, yeah, I say we. We talk next weekend if we want to come on and do a quick show. We're both available. Let's go. But, like, let's not commit to anything. Classic okay. Canada Puck Podcast shenanigans. Maybe, maybe around, like, the draft or something. Like, the Saturday morning of the draft if we're both free. Like, maybe get together and chat because maybe there's a trade. But other than that, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, the Canada Puck Podcast would not be the Canada Puck Podcast without our babe of the week. And I cannot do a podcast without bringing up this because it's my favorite thing to do now. I tell everybody about it. I don't think I've mentioned this lady before. At least I hope I have. And if I, if I have, it's been a few years. But I, my me- method of record keeping only lasts me about a season. So I know it hasn't been this season. Megan Mickelson Reed. I don't even know who she does hockey analyst for, but I remember Megan Mickelson being like the gem of gems growing up. Lady still got it, and she's doing hockey analysis for somebody. You can find her on Instagram at Mickelson12, M I K K E L S O N 1 2. I just, oh, it's Sportsnet. I didn't know it was Sportsnet. I finally saw the microphone. Mm hmm. She's a cutie. Good for her. I don't know if you remember, like, late university years, but, like, Megan Mickelson was all the rage. And she is still all the rage because as I'm slowly maturing, so is my porn search history. And big MILF guy these days. Cool. (laughs) Cool. So, Megan Mickelson, Reed, you are our babe of the week. Shall we? Wing indeed. There you go. Awesome. So with that, that wraps up Canada Puck Babe for a year. Maybe maybe you'll see us one more time for the next off season. But there you go. Ten o'clock Saturday mornings are now free on our schedule. So good stuff. Yeah, a lot more milf searches coming up in our Saturday mornings. I can tell you that much. Sweet. All right. Well, thanks, Grant. Thanks for um, sticking with me for another year. And. Uh, I don't know what next year. We, we talked about expanding, bringing new stuff in. We did nothing. So I'm not even going to mention. I'm not even going to pretend like we're talking about that this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? We'll see where the wind carries us. All right. So with that, we say for a final time, maybe. Yeah, we're back. I don't know. This season. Party on, Grant. Party on, Mick. Maybe we'll see everybody next week.